recently, you may have noticed some very specifically targeted advertisements on the web, primarily on YouTube and Twitter. There's been a spate of anti-trans propaganda from a few ultra-conservative sources, namely the Epoch Times and PragerU. While it's not hate speech in and of itself because they purport to be documentaries, they play into a hateful culture war campaign the right wing has been waging in America. Fans of the channel will no doubt think of Matt Walsh, a grumpy weirdo who I've already dedicated way too much time talking about. If you want to know why you shouldn't trust his opinions on anything, go watch these videos that show why he's a thin-skinned baby man who bases his entire life on spite. Yet Matt Walsh struck conservative base gold with his documentary What is a Woman, inspiring legions of people who don't have custody of their children to take their anger out on internet comment sections by smugly asking the question, what is a woman? It doesn't matter what answer they get because like the documentary of Matt Walsh's, they're not actually trying to understand something. They've already made up their mind on an issue and now only want to make strangers as miserable as they are. What is a Woman isn't so much a documentary as it is a culmination of Matt's lifetime of anger at people who are just different than him. He finally got a point that conservatives agreed with him on enough to at least fund his hate, and the result was a success for his employer and the production company of the documentary, The Daily Wire. But now others want a sweet piece of that transphobia grift pie, which has led to people of all stripes, including trans people and their allies, seeing open advertisements for propaganda that, in following in Matt's footsteps, doesn't aim to understand any issues around transgender people so much as lead viewers to a predetermined verdict that trans people are evil and that the trans movement is coming for your kids. So let's look into the most recent effort in the culture war, PragerU's documentary, D-Trans. But before we begin, let's talk about the company who is trying to convince your grandparents that trans people are the devil. PragerU is the brainchild of human slug hybrid gone horribly wrong Dennis Prager and is the culmination of his life's work, or at least that's what he wants you to believe. We all know who the real brains of the operation is here. No, not the dog. Conservative billionaires. While calling itself a nonprofit, PragerU is both not a university as it offers no classes or accreditation and also does turn a profit mostly from wealthy Republicans. As of 2015, PragerU received an estimated 6.5 million in funding from the billionaire Wilkes Brothers alone, and that was still relatively early into the outlet's life. Dennis himself has advocated for conservative causes for decades, hearkening back to good old fashioned values like forcing your wife to have sex with you if she doesn't want to. If you love your husband and he is a good man, then don't let mood alone determine whether or not you'll have sex with him. Because it's an important thing to him, so give it a try. In broad strokes, Dennis Prager is an old man version of the modern, traditional Western values style of conservatism. Uh, yet without the edge or gruff of somebody like Rush Limbaugh or Alex Jones. So he's just kind of a boring old dude. All these videos make me sad to watch because in his eyes I can see that he knows the promise of his youth has faded because he spent his entire life shilling for people who just see him as a stooge and now his only recourse is to continue playing that role until he is swallowed by the abyss. Now here comes the you part of Prager You because like the Daily Wires trying to pathetically push propaganda uh, and original programming into the culture war, PragerU has been trying to force their way into education since at least 2014. They do this primarily through short ad-friendly videos hosted by a variety of conservative commentators covering pretty much anything conservatives could be mad about. The propaganda is effective because if you don't know who these people are, their videos just seem like maybe slightly biased informational videos, and the bite-sized presentation is ideal for appealing to online boomers who will share it with their families. The problem is, the sources they use to draw these conclusions are easily torn apart and scrutinized. I'll link some good Sean videos down below that show off how laughable their rhetoric is, but it shouldn't be a surprise by now that they succeed, like many on the right, because their lies take longer to disprove than they do to tell. And because of their massive amount of output, they tell a lot of lies. I'll also provide a link below for the website Desmog, which lists off plenty of their stances and controversies with sources cited, because it is a long and branching web of deceit that they weave and I don't have all day. 
And now their latest bit of propaganda seems to be everywhere due to a massive ad buy that included spending one million for Twitter ads. If you're wondering why a company would take money from Prager for blatant transphobia propaganda, check out this video where I go into the history of Elon's Twitter and how he turned it into a hate platform while continuing to bleed money. As a result of this massive spend, so many people have seen this documentary in particular advertised to them. While the Epoch Times anti-trans documentary was primarily relegated to ads on YouTube, D-Trans, the title of PragerU's doc, has been pushed to Twitter and YouTube, no doubt aided by the almighty algorithm that guide our lives and see that if you're trans or into transgender stuff, you might be interested in this. D-Trans is a piece of propaganda tailor-made to preach to the choir. Throughout, it relies on familiar conservative buzzwords and talking points that really only serve to reaffirm the already convinced or scare people on the fence to their side of the issue. Unsurprisingly, it's not a fair look at any of the aspects of detransitioning or medical trans care or gender affirming care. You need to understand that this is meant to spread fear, not facts. Through a variety of editing tricks, music and sound stingers, and cut up interviews, D-Trans is meant to look and feel like a horror story. It's meant to manipulate viewers to seeing trans people, especially young trans people, as poor, misguided souls in need of redemption. So if you or someone you know has been convinced or rattled by it, I'd ask them to really deconstruct not just the info they've been given through it, but how it's delivered, because that's what a lot of this documentary thrives on. D-Trans takes the saccharine approach of appealing to the idea of a lost childhood for trans kids. It opens with a somber clip of a child talking to a stuffed animal before the titular D-Transitioner comes on screen to talk about how much she misses her old voice. I really am sad that I took my voice for granted. Like, I didn't just take it for granted, I hated it. Like, and now like I would go, I would do anything to have that voice again. You see, she has detransitioned from trans mask and as a side effect of taking testosterone, her voice has been permanently altered. And from here we get a montage of this person as a small child, intercut with medical personnel and hearings advocating for trans youth healthcare. For the right wing already familiar with the issue due to the way Matt Walsh, Prager and others have mined it for content, the inference here is easy to draw. We're seeing the trans cult trying to destroy children and take away their innocence. Immediately, the way I found this person depicted is downright insulting and infantilizing. There are certain themes you notice after watching trans folks for so long. One is that they see trans feminine people as predatory because they equate maleness to predation, and they see trans masculine people as poor, hapless victims because they see femaleness as inherently being weak and helpless. That's what's being depicted here. And soon we get the full title, D-Trans, The Dangers of Trans Healthcare. The documentary primarily focuses on Daisy Strongin, the girl at the beginning. Interestingly, she starts by recounting her early experiences with dysphoria, with not seeing herself as other girls did, not identifying with how they presented. She talks about very common aspects of dysphoria like depression and anxiety and loneliness. However, some quick scary lighting and cuts want to make this seem not like dysphoria, but a side effect of trans indoctrination, not a medical condition that can be alleviated with treatment and affirming care, but a deep well of depravity swallowing her whole. I always just felt very much like there was just something wrong with me and I was trying to figure it out and I used the internet to help me do that. That's where I felt like I could diagnose myself. That doesn't stop Daisy's words here from relaying an experience I think many trans people, even non-binary they thems like myself, can easily identify with. So she went looking on the internet and found trans people. So far, the doc is fine. And here is where PragerU's real agenda comes into action. My favorite websites were YouTube and Tumblr. It's such a huge amount of content that I consumed at that time. I mean, I watched a lot of trans people. I watched a lot of, you know, gender transformation videos and saw these people really just like go from female to male. We get insidious background music as Daisy browses transgender tags on Tumblr. The connection to the viewer being that she was essentially brainwashed by the internet and people who support transitioning, which is another right-wing talking point. They even linger on a video of trans content creators in pastels, which I think is purposefully an allusion to another misconception that links 
trans people to age players. The way Daisy speaks here and the way the video is cut brings to mind other documentaries and testimonials I've seen on things like addiction, especially as it applies to drugs or porn, and I don't think that's an accident. By combining these descriptions of support and praise with these quickly flashing images and of happy trans people and suspenseful music, it creates a somewhat sickening feeling for the viewer, much like Daisy was describing becoming hooked on drugs. We then get another cut where Daisy points out that people consuming this media are mostly children. It's really dark when you think about it because the people who are consuming this are children, like 13, 14, 15 years old, and it's so easy for them to literally be groomed. However, that's an entirely apocryphal statement. It's just taken as fact, there's no real proof given, no study cited to back it up. Daisy then says it was easy for them to be literally groomed, so we've got the grooming talking point down. Less than four minutes in, and this thing has managed to shove in groomer panic, targeted at trans people, infantilizing trans mask people, and subliminally linking online trans content to a dangerous rabbit hole. Yippee. And it gets worse. <laughs> And then immediately after, you got her talking about gender identity and sexualities and throwing names out so fast, nobody who's familiar with what she's talking about has a hope of knowing what she's talking about. I just started looking into all of it. I was like, oh, so there's gender queer, gender fluid, there's agender, there's like, you can be a demi girl, which is when you're like 90% girl. But that's the point. It's why this doc is only 20 minutes, I bet. Partially because I bet they couldn't find enough people with a through line to make a feature length one, but also because the purpose is to bludgeon viewers with a slew of negative emotions so quickly, they don't have time to question them. The purpose here, again, isn't to understand the clear and obvious delineations between gender and sexual attraction, between personal identity and sexual orientation, but to play to a base that remains willfully ignorant of very simple concepts like gender fluidity or pansexuality because if they took the time to learn what these meant, they might understand someone better and wouldn't have ammunition for their ignorance. So then Daisy recounts beginning transition and mental health workers telling their parents that if they don't validate their trans son, the dysphoria will get worse. I will get to trans suicidality among teens in a minute, just wait. So I came out to my parents as Ollie and you know I went to this, I guess, behavioral, mental health clinic for like six days. They had a meeting with my parents and they basically told my parents that if you don't validate Oliver, if you don't validate him, then this is just gonna get worse. The best thing that you can do to help him is to accept him. However, there are already a few things missing here from Daisy's picture. We don't get a picture of how the parents feel about the transition. The video goes from saying I'm transitioning to Daisy saying she spent six days in a health facility, but generally that doesn't happen on its own. That's not how tests are run. That's what happens when someone has an episode where they are at risk of harming themselves or someone else. In a separate article from the turf outlet, the Independent Women's Forum, Daisy explains how she felt retroactively. She describes her parents as horrified and initially unapproving, even using the words, quote, transphobic discrimination. At the bottom of the article, she also snaps at a doctor who's just being respectful and asking her pronouns, saying, I'm not playing the pronoun game anymore. Like, damn girl, you never heard of bedside manner? It's a small article I'll link below, but does give some glimpse into how much ideology, specifically anti-trans ideology, had taken over Daisy's worldview by the time the interview came out which we can see from things like her depicting a medical professional asking her pronouns as a pronoun game. Back to the video where PragerU is depicting Daisy's confusion amid seeking mental help. Daisy's testimonial here is incredibly confusingly edited. She talks about not being able to make sense of her feelings, which plays into the conservative narrative that mental health professionals will just trans kids at the slightest sign of trouble. We don't get more looks at her relationships, but just more scary flashing cuts and voiceovers that depict Daisy as a scared child looking for any answer to why she feels lonely and sad, and essentially being forced by healthcare professionals in the internet to accept that it's dysphoria. The problem with showing a child here and drawing this comparison for the viewer is that it's another manipulation tactic. Daisy was not a child when she began transitioning. She was 18 an adult who, by her own testimony, had been considering transition for years. She didn't get her mastectomy until two years later, at the age of 20. Another thing I bet PragerU doesn't want to mention is that Daisy detransitioned coinciding with a conversion to Christianity. 
In a YouTube video posted to her channel, which starts with a biblical quote, Daisy announced her detransition to the world in October of 2020. She divided her video into three parts with the final section dealing with her faith. Much of the video talks about her personal feelings of dissonance, hopelessness, and emptiness, and I can really empathize with what she's been through. I think most people who have struggled with dysphoria, dysmorphia, or other self-image issues can. In the video, she talks about how her parents didn't support her, and also how her feelings of Christianity emerged alongside her feelings of detransition. And this is where I take issue with a lot of Daisy's testimony and trusting her. Because she talks about being a hardcore atheist, despite knowing deep down God was real, in retrospect. My interest in Christianity emerged alongside my doubtful feelings of transition. I think even then I really believed all these things deep down, but I couldn't face them consciously because of what its implications were for my life. Much of like she talks about being happy with transitioning at the time in the Prager U talk, but deep down knowing that nobody saw her as a real man and were just appeasing her in retrospect. Everyone's calling me Ollie. Everyone sees me as a guy. But then at the end of the day, when I'm home in my room, looking in the mirror, I'm like, What did I do? Like, I start getting these, like, really scary thoughts of, like, you're incomplete. You're not a guy. I don't know her, and I don't know if she's grifting or lying, and I have no reason to accuse her of either. But Daisy has a distinct trend of sounding so assured of something as she's saying it, including her transition and detransition, only her, for her to say multiple times that deep down she knew different all along. And on a personal note, I think that makes it really hard for me to take her current Catholic pushing anti-trans crusade as genuine because she's shown no real consistency over time. As an example, the description of her video notes that just a few months later, she didn't identify as Christian anymore, but upon updating in 2023, she is now Catholic. I'm assuming she's got like a trad cat thing going on. Another example is how she describes coming to Christianity the thing that spurred her current life goals in a very similar way to the way she describes learning about trans people in the Prager U doc. Around this time, I started watching like Christian lifestyle videos on YouTube where people would talk about their faith and how it influences their life. And I remember being repelled and fascinated by it at the same time. And I remember thinking too, that if I ever became a Christian, I, I wouldn't want to be like that, you know. Uh living with restrictions. And I realize now that I treated transitioning like it was a resurrection, right? I didn't understand how religious my motives were for transitioning. I wanted to be born again, but I wasn't willing yet to do it in Christ. For her, it sounds like another internet pipeline, the one that comes with way more ideological baggage to unpack. And I wanna be clear, I don't hate religion at all, and there are so many wonderfully supportive people of faith out there who do care for LGBT people. But the world of popular Christian YouTube channels leans more towards things like Girl Defined and plenty of channels and people that do their best to proselytize and get people into living the kind of traditional life Daisy is living now. Interestingly, she also takes the stance in her video that her journey is just for her, that this is her choice and that other trans people are still valid. Not everyone should detransition. This is just how she feels. And I respect that, at least in this video, because as we'll see later, it's a stark difference to how she seems to feel by the time the documentary comes out in 2023. And then comes the part about finding the Bible and studying it during quarantine. I will let these words speak for themselves. And so one day I just decided I'm going to start taking the Bible seriously as truth, like as the truth, capital T truth. And I realized this might sound like self-indoctrination, but I was like desperate for meaning. And I keep talking about how I'm looking for meaning through this, but part of me maybe wasn't genuinely looking for meaning because of what I knew that converting would mean for my life. Thinking that you could really understand the Bible and have it affect your life in a meaningful way without submitting to it, without taking it seriously as what it says it is, is naive. Anyone who reads the Bible as cultural narrative or mythology, that's all it will end up being to them. 
likewise as something to criticize or laugh at, which is how I used to read it. So I started praying as I would read scripture, and I would pray with the understanding that the Almighty God, the creator of the universe, was listening. And I opened myself up to scripture, and I didn't give my life to Christ just yet, but I opened myself up to scripture and prayer, and I would do this seriously, and I had some very powerful moments. There's really no other way to say this. I felt the presence of God. It wasn't really like I was looking for it. It just came over me. So, desperate for meaning and drawn into a rabbit hole of conservatism, while her disapproving family fought her transition, she became a Christian. Or at least for a few months until she became Catholic. Consistency, again. Despite her search for meaning, however, it's also important to note that as early as a few days after this documentary, Daisy went on a Twitter thread saying she still has dysphoria. It hasn't gone away. She just fears transitioning because of what it might mean for her family, friends, and church life. Which is something to keep in mind as we get closer to talking about why many people detransition in the first place. Even back as far as September 2023, she talks about still fantasizing about being a man. So after everything, in her own words, Daisy still feels dysphoria, or at the very least, she feels the same depressive feelings she had before even transitioning. Does that mean transition wasn't right for her? Should she retransition? I don't know. And because of the narrow worldview she seems to have forced herself into, I don't know if she'll ever find out herself. I have a lot of sympathy for anybody who makes an irreversible choice they don't think was right for them, and I'm honestly glad if Daisy wants to be a Catholic trad wife mom that she gets to live out that dream. Good for her. I'm speaking entirely from a personal standpoint about somebody I don't know, which I know is risky, and I acknowledge that, but when I see how quickly she's bounced from point to point, and by how her own admission she seems not just easily convinced of drastic measures, but eager to buy into them, I have a hard time seeing Daisy's case as anything other than someone who needed genuine counseling. Through all her drastic measures to find meaning, she still seems to have the same depressive feeling she started with, and that makes me really feel for her. I can't imagine what that would be like, but to position her personal journey as some kind of indictment of gender-affirming care is disingenuous and manipulative. The way she is depicted in the documentary is like she was groomed as a child by YouTube, drawn into the ideology of the trans cult. But she didn't start transition until she was 18, a legal adult, and she didn't have her mastectomy until two years later. Again, I do feel sympathy for anyone that makes a major medical choice and has to live with regret. I can't imagine what it would be like. But I don't think it's fair for her, and by extension Prager you to try and use her personal regret and mistakes as fodder to propagandize their war on trans people. And Daisy's transition story isn't even unique to her. If her main reasons, as she's talked about, for detransition were personal, that's understandable. But I suspect her parents' disapproval and religion also played a heavy role because she's indicated as much. I want to talk really quick about detransition and particularly why people detransition. In this 2021 paper from the National Library of Medicine, a case study showed that from a portion of tested subjects who had pursued gender transition and detransitioned, 82.5 of those detransitioners cited an external factor with 35.6 citing pressure from a parent and 32.5 citing social or community stigma. An earlier 2015 study of 28,000 people said only 8% detransitioned, and 62 of those detransitioners did so due to similar external factors. Moreover, it is well known and cited that transition regret like displayed by Daisy and other subjects of the documentary isn't common at all. They are an incredibly small minority. Of 27 different studies across 8,000 people who had received gender-affirming surgeries, only 1% exhibited regret, some of which was temporary. I recommend reading this March article from the Associated Press that not only cites these studies, but also provides input from medical providers who have done these surgeries and see for themselves how low the rates of regret are. These are well-documented facts and incredibly important to keep in mind as we see the next few speakers in the documentary. After Daisy, we cut to another detransitioner, Abel Garcia. He's not on the screen 10 seconds before he blames a YouTube video that just shows the existence of trans people as, quote, planting the seeds of doubt. I was surfing YouTube one day and a video popped up male to female and that eventually planted the seeds of doubt. This again plays into popular narratives that we've seen that 
trans people shouldn't even be visible in society, something that even Matt Walsh has said. And how did Michael Knowles put it? Then for the good of society, and especially for the good of the poor people who have fallen prey to this confusion, transgenderism must be eradicated from public life entirely. The whole preposterous ideology. For more info on ideas like trans genocide and violence against trans people and trans visibility, go check out my video, Righteous Anger, which I will link down below. Like Daisy, Abel is also a D-trans activist, though the doc doesn't ever say that. In a video uploaded to his YouTube channel, Abel says that he wasn't really into politics before transitioning, but then also details how politically active he became later. My prior to politics was really boring. Just your typical le liberal, democrat, and LGBT activist. Um, I noticed my first change in politics um, a little a year, a little over a year into my transition, and that was when I attended a police academy. And I know my instructors were politics-wise. Most, if not all, were uh, on the right side of politics, right of center. In the videos on the channel, we see Abel again saying he transitioned at the age of 19, so well into being a legal adult, not at all aligned with the narrative of trans and kids that PragerU is trying to push here. Two years later, Abel got breast implants and realized he made a mistake. However, again, this is a person who is a full legal adult asking medical professionals for an operation after they gave him years of therapy. Much of the issue Abel had was finding a surgeon to undo his top surgery, which is again regrettable, and I feel for the discomfort that must have caused. But looking at it medically, I can totally understand why doctors and insurance providers would be hesitant to approve him within a year of just getting a surgery. He had been transitioning for a long time with a medical record to prove it and suddenly wanted another intensive surgery when very likely his body hadn't even fully recovered from the first one yet. There are a lot of factors here that just aren't discussed, like Abel being a devout Christian and conservative. See, if PragerU showed how much conservative evangelical faith had to do with detransitioning, it wouldn't help their narrative. So they want this to be a big tent issue, so to speak, which means they keep their evangelical agenda, on the down low here. So instead, Abel simply talks about how he was led astray by trans ideology, which led him to hurting his family and himself. It allowed me to be caught by the ideology that eventually led me to hurt myself. Like with Daisy, Abel recounts his story by saying he went to a therapist and was labeled trans and given a quick freeway on-ramp to transition. I just wanted an answer to be given to me on who I was and I went to see a therapist and I had only asked, I think I might be trans, I don't know, I want to know. The therapist immediately on my first appointment with her said, yes I am a transgender woman, she had my letter to transition the same appointment. The problem here that again goes against the narrative that Prager sets out for is that by his own admission in the past, Abel had feelings of dysphoria from as young as 12. We get more sad long shots, sound clips of thunderclouds overhead. Abel's father discovers Abel is trans femme presenting and takes him to Mexico to have sex he describes as against his will with a prostitute. But eventually my father found out what I was doing and due to our culture, he was not happy and he took me to Mexico and had me have sexual relationship against my will with a prostitute. The way the story of this 19 year old is shown is sickening and using this obviously traumatic experience for anti-trans propaganda is ghoulish. Instead of laying the blame firmly at the feet of an abusive parent, this is being depicted as yet another side effect of being trans, something that wouldn't have happened to Abel if he didn't exhibit dysphoria. It's a really heartbreaking scene that ends with Abel saying it broke him. He then talks about fast-tracking transition, which ends with a scary cliffhanger before going back to Daisy's story. So not only do they display the father's abuse as caused by his gender nonconformity, but they play into the long disproven idea that queer people are the way they are because of a traumatic experience linked to sexuality. 
Anyway, Daisy, now going by Ollie, charts her voice's journey on testosterone, which for people who don't go through a male puberty can change the vocal cords and deepen your voice. Not only did they send me home with the hormones, but I actually did my very first shot right there in the doctor's office. And I was just euphoric and it was real. And I was actually gonna start seeing changes and I was gonna start passing. We get more fear mongering that makes it sound like Daisy walked literally right in and just got a testosterone shot on a first visit. But we already know she's been in and out of treatment and seen several medical professionals at this point. She then describes how happy she was to start transitioning. She describes how euphoric she was to pass. Then we get testimony from Harmeet K. Dilam, who is just depicted as an expert here for some reason. In reality, she is a highly biased source and a former vice chair for the California Republican Party and a frequent Fox News guest. She has no medical background and no qualifications for talking about this issue aside from being associated with prominent detransitioners like Chloe Cole. She was also a legal advisor to Trump's 2020 campaign and openly advocated for the Supreme Court to help Trump win the presidency. So that's who's talking here. Interestingly, we get fear-mongering about trans people in the mainstream advertising world. And of course they play the video of Dylan Mulvaney doing a promo TikTok that a ton of other influencers also did. I say this is interesting because they focus on a one-off by Dylan that became well known on the right wing because of culture war weirdos pushing it as a talking point. They don't mention, for example, this Smirnoff commercial with Laverne Cox or this L'Oreal commercial with Hari Neff because the points in this video aren't about broad criticism but targeting structural weak points that conservatives are already familiar with. Remember, this is a piece of propaganda meant to either preach to the choir or by using an assortment of repeated buzzwords like trans ideology and people like Dylan Mulvaney, this documentary is meant to indoctrinate viewers into the anti-transgender movement. Then we hear from another person Prager used presenting as an expert, Dr. Lior Sapir. The documentary points out that he has a PhD, so obviously, as a doctor who's presenting facts on trans kids in healthcare, he's a trustworthy source, right? No, because Prager U doesn't present the fact that his doctorate is in political science. Doctor. 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 At this point, it won't surprise you to learn that he's also a far-right activist who has been featured on PragerU and Fox News in the past. He says things like, we know it's not true that trans kids don't get health and mental assessments for trans healthcare. So they're often told that they're going to get comprehensive, multidisciplinary mental health assessments. We know that that's not true. In practice, these kids were put on a fast track to medical transition. Doesn't cite any sources, so how do we know it? Aside from the mere existence of detransitioners that make up an exceptionally small portion of trans healthcare, why should we believe anything these people are saying? The reality is that while gender affirming care is a constantly improving and evolving practice, especially for youth, it's also intensive and has plenty of standards of medical oversight. There are incredibly detailed practice guidelines that may vary by state, but remain detailed and often intensive no matter where you reside. And as we've already seen, the cases Prager you are trying to link to trans youth care are the cases of adults, not kids. We then see Chloe Cole giving a testimony that is cut with footage of Abel and Daisy, with the clear inference being that medical providers who advocate for transition and specifically give parents information around trans suicidality are trying to manipulate and lie to their parents. This might be one of the most unconscionable misconceptions Prager used documentary pushes, essentially giving the viewers free reign to ignore the common outcries about trans suicidality that often accompany trans advocation. The truth is that much like with detransition, the stress related to trans people that can be linked to thoughts of suicide, depression, and self-harm, are most often also caused by external factors. Some studies show that as many as 80% of trans individuals have at least thought about suicide. One study in Canada that grouped queer identities such as homosexual and trans found that in general, LGBTQ identifying youths were at five times higher risk of suicidal ideation. A 2022 study tried to answer why suicidal ideation seemed so high and found, quote, thwarted belongingness and perceived burdensomeness as being primary factors. In layman's terms, not belonging or feeling like a burden. And shown here by the Trevor Project, this isn't just an issue relegated to trans people or transitioners, but queer people in general. 
And many of those queer people face the same issues, including homelessness and disapproval from their family or community. And when you ask, well, why are these rates so high? Another study from 2015 showed that parental support from trans and gender non-conforming youth may be as low as one third. With another study from the American Center for Pediatrics in 2009 saying that parental rejection plays a role in suicidal ideation, use of drugs, and other issues like depression. I will link all of these papers below, and also be sure to check out the Trevor Project article which cites so many academic sources and papers it will make your head spin. But the point here, contrary again to what PragerU is trying to push, is that depression and suicidal ideation are real issues for many queer and trans kids. And it's because of external factors like not being accepted by parents, friends, family, churches, and their community. Trans people face depression every day when they go online and get harassed, dehumanized, and threatened for no reason other than simply trying to be happy with who they are. When doctors tell parents the dangers of rejecting gender-affirming care, they're not doing it to manipulate them. They're doing it to inform them of the very real, factual, and well-documented dangers to the child. So then we get more fake factual statements from doctor not actually a doctor. The ideology that has become dominant at these clinics is that trans kids know who they are and therefore to question them, to ask basic therapeutic questions like, could your gender dysphoria or gender identity have been triggered by some other event in your life? Basic questions of screening are completely taboo in these circles. Again, with no real proof. Then we finally get to the real thesis of this documentary, around the 14 minute mark out of 20. Part of the problem is that the current cohort of teenagers that are being transitioned under the affirmative protocol, which lacks guardrails, which takes kids at their word when they say I'm trans. Study published in 2022 by researchers who are advocates of gender-affirming surgeries showed that the youngest patient to have received a radical bilateral mastectomy in the United States is 12 years old. We get quick cuts in an official looking study that gets cited as a source. But what was the study on? Let's go check it out. It's a 2022 study from the Canadian Medical Journal which they even say is, quote, in favor of gender-affirming care. I'm assuming because conservatives can't find any reputable medical source that will deny the benefits of trans healthcare for trans youth. They want to use this paper as proof that there's a trans epidemic on the rise, and while the paper does show an increase in trans-identifying youth seeking gender-affirming care, it also shows things like mental health improving and hormone blockers being used to delay puberty, both things PragerU doesn't really want to talk about. And when they talk about rates for gender identity among youth being as high as 1.4 to 4.1%, PragerU fails to mention that includes people with non-binary identities who may not take any gender-affirming care aside from socially transitioning. The study also says that the rates of depression and anxiety for trans youth who are affirmed by family and friends is the same as cis children, and lower than trans kids who are not. Yet, because conservatives can't not be weird about children, we get to talking about 12-year-olds, because apparently the youngest double mastectomy was on a 12-year-old female. If you really want to know whether amputating the breasts of a 12 or 13-year-old girl is ultimately in her best long-term interests, ask her when she's 30 or 40. This is depicted as a horrendous crime, and it's the same kind of atrocity that the anti-trans lobby calls butchery and equates to murder. It's odd, however, that they generally don't seem to feel that way about making a girl the same age carry a child. That's also going to cause irreparable harm and more likely death. Far more harm, at least, than a double mastectomy. So why do you believe that a 13-year-old should be forced to give birth to their rapist child? I don't think that it is ever okay to kill a child. Okay, uh, so then why do you support a 13-year-old giving birth to their rapist child, which could kill them? This is not about, this is not about, the person who has caused that condition, mm -hmm. the person who has caused this situation is the rapist. Now, if you want to kill somebody because of what has happened to this poor child, then I absolutely- I feel like you're not answering my question. Well, However, there's also nothing to say that this 12 year old regrets transitioning or that they aren't living a perfectly happy, fine life, aided by not suffering a major point of female puberty with breast growth. The person themselves is never taken into account no, because we have a few suspect stories about quick transition for legal adults who say, hey, I want to transition, now this outlier case is somehow representative of everything medical professionals are doing. 
we get terms like, quote, amputating the breasts of a 12 or 13 year old girl. As we see video of a mother lovingly cradling a baby as somber music continues to play. Again, this is sideshow theater for conservatives to gawk in horror at. And if you're thinking, well, maybe they are happy. Maybe they can grow up with proper health care and live their teenage years as a teen boy without missing out on pivotal social experiences and suffering the emotional stress and fallout from that. Uh, his answer is that we can't know until she's 30 or 40 and unable to have kids or breastfeed. You know, after she's lived her youth in a depressive haze. Good job. Good, good idea. We then get a clip of a trans mass person reacting with joy as they see their post-surgery body for the first time. But again, the editing here is meant to portray foreboding. This person can't know what they actually want. Look how sad that is for them. The problem with this documentary and the infantilizing nature so many of the rights narratives take is that it takes something that for so many is so beautiful and tries to poison and twist it, which is what we see here. For many trans men and trans mask people, this is a moment they dream of for years. To say nothing of rest reductions done for cis women who feel body dysmorphia or cis men who have gynecomastia. But the point of the doc isn't to look at people who it works for, but to focus on a few people who were unhappy. And in the two cases it brings on, they should both bring up questions about if they transitioned because it wasn't right for them or because they were trying to fit in the box others put around them. Uh, Christianity and conservatism, namely, like the people at PragerU. And to top off this cliche shit sandwich, the documentary ends by reaffirming the idea that trans people don't pass, and even if they do outwardly, they won't to themselves. It's a more cleverly edited version of the troglodytes who post, you'll never be a woman, and archeologists in 300 years will be able to tell what kind of hips you have. You're incomplete. You're not a guy. You never will be. But even though you're legally, you know, your driver's license says you're a guy, you know you're not. You finally have expressed your true inner self or whatever, the thing that you wanted to do so badly ever since you were like 13, 14 years old. You did this thing to alleviate this gender dysphoria, you know, that wasn't there before, but you made it into a problem and now your body image issues are worse. Daisy and Aiden both end their stories by sadly recounting all they've lost to trans ideology. But we already know how disingenuous the framing is here because not only have their histories not been presented accurately, but neither have their reasons for advocating so strongly against trans healthcare. I do feel bad for the struggles of Daisy and Aiden, and I absolutely have sympathy for anyone who feels they were manipulated or had malpractice done to them and regret it. But I can be sympathetic and understanding of their struggles while also acknowledging that their arguments aren't from a place of science or experience, but regret and bias. In keeping their stories lean and stripped down, PragerU has made something that will likely be effective propaganda for the easily convinced and almost certainly for the already convinced. But if anyone looks into who these sources actually are, these four people talking about a medical scourge taking over the nation, they're all easily proven as partisan speakers who push obvious agendas, not based in facts, but their convenient politics. Politics that, conveniently enough, also earn them money. We end with Daisy talking about how she wanted to change when she found out she was pregnant. And then she makes a blanket statement that plenty of other young people who went through dysphoria think transitioning will save them. And in her words, that's just not true. There are so many young people who are going through very similar things that I did and are still being told that transition will save them. And it's just not true. This is a stark change from her more metered, just for me approach in her earlier announcement video. Dysphoria, by the way, she still attests that she feels today, let's, let's not forget. And here's the real goal of this entire insidious piece of propaganda. This one line from Daisy, it's not meant to promote awareness of medical malpractice, it's not meant to caution parents and take medical advice with a grain of salt. This video is meant to depict all trans people and anyone who supports them as liars, lying to themselves that they could ever be something other than what others expect, lying to others that they could be happy if they transition, lying to parents and patients that trans kids may be at a higher risk of suicide. Daisy's words here offer a finality for people to walk away with, that combined with apocryphal arguments with no sources, misrepresented articles, and spiteful ideologues, want to leave the viewer not with the idea that transition isn't the right move for some people, 
but that is essentially the wrong move for every person. That there's no such thing as a valid trans person. And for the ending emotional gut punch, we get an assortment of detransitioners who are apparently just relegated to the B squad and had to call in over Zoom. They're quickly cut together to illustrate the point that this is a widespread issue, but let's look at who these people are. You got Jamie Gorrell, who goes by Zosia Gorrell now and is a hardline feminist and detrans activist. Laura Becker, uh, Laura is a detrans YouTuber and artist who describes herself as based, which we all know is cringe. Her entire output is based around detransition and she has a cat named after Jordan Peterson. And she d didn't even go, it wasn't even a clever cat name. She didn't even go with Jordan Potterson, which is right there. Ashton Eskridge is another YouTuber whose entire personality and output is detrans stuff. And she only has two videos. Her big claim was that she was convinced she was transgender by TikTok, as stated in this New York Post article. So another really trustworthy source. Ellie Palmer. Would you believe it? Another D-transer who made YouTube videos and it's just her whole thing now. Camille Keifel. Keifel made headlines when she sued doctors for breast removal that resulted in complications. While suing for malpractice in the event of complications is totally fine, she was 29 when she wanted surgery. A legal adult for 11 years. Medically, her case shouldn't be different than any cis person who wants reductions or implants, yet she is suing for almost a million dollars. The New York Post article plays into anti-trans talking points, positioning her reason for gender variance and exploring as trauma linked to abuse of a childhood friend and gasping that she was approved for surgery after only two visits. And of the bunch, I think Kaifel is the one I have least sympathy for because at what point do you take responsibility for your own mistakes? If you go to a medical professional as an adult, not even an 18 year old, 29 years old, and they give you what you ask for because you appear to be of sound mind, that shouldn't be on them. Complications, absolutely. But the surgery itself, the counseling she got, where is the line drawn? It's another illustration of how these kinds of people don't see any transition as valid. This isn't really about kids or protecting kids until they know what they want because so many people here weren't kids. This is about stopping any trans person from finding happiness. And these testimonies are all aimed towards basically pleading for trans people and their allies to advocate detransition. It's not too late for you to have kids and boobs, ah. But when you actually dig into the murderer's row of activists they've assembled here, you'll find the same basic talking points and ideological backgrounds. After Matt Walsh's documentary made the rounds for famously lying to its subjects uh, and manipulating trans people to make them look silly, I'm not surprised the only people they could get here are ones that already agreed with them. Not that they'd want anybody else. And that shouldn't be surprising, that's the conservative way. They seemingly cannot fathom anyone finding mental happiness outside of their narrow definitions of what things should be, what a parent or a mother should be, what a man or a woman should be. And it should also be noted that most of the detransitioners they talk to are AFAB women. Because remember, trans men are just poor helpless girls who have been led astray while trans women are perverts and sexually broken deviants. On that note, one male transitioner we throw in at the very, very end is Ollie London, who I somehow haven't talked about for this channel, but let's do a really quick uh, breakdown because he's such a good example of the D-trans grift. For those who don't know, Ollie London is an embarrassing grifter who transitioned to another gender for six months. Oh wait, I forgot the important part. He spent hundreds of thousands of dollars as an adult to look South Korean because he was obsessed with a K-pop star, Jimin. And he also identified as South Korean, causing controversy. Uh, he also apparently even prayed to a cardboard cutout of Jimin at some point. In March 2022, he announced he had plans for a penis reduction surgery to be more in line with the average of South Korea, which is not correct. Uh, to begin with. A few months later, he then said he was transitioning to being a trans woman. So this is a person who is obviously worth taking very seriously and has a good track record of ideological consistency. In October of that same year, he made a very public statement about his detransition that he had barely started. Then a year later, he came out with a book decrying transition called Gender Madness. 
Ollie London is an exceptionally stupid person who makes impulsive decisions but has always been pathetically and transparently desperate for a spotlight. Like his continued efforts to break into K-pop. Sorry in advance for doing this to you, by the way. There's probably a good reason why Ollie wasn't shown more here, because he makes most anti-trans activism look bad. He exposes himself as an obvious grifter and by extension, many of his cohorts. And then after a musical buildup in the documentary, we get a stinger of a zoom in on a PNG file they use for advertising. It looks so ridiculously cheap and out of place for what is otherwise pretty slickly produced propaganda. We end with a plea to sign a petition to stop trans ideology doesn't have a proper page, it just tells you to go check out PragerU, so I thought, what the heck, I'm, I'm this far, I might as well go all the way to hell. Currently, DTrans is at the top of the PragerU homepage and has only about 250,000 views, which is actually not great for a million dollar ad campaign like, holy shit, you guys suck at this. You have to click on the video dropdown to see the link to signing the petition, which, playing into those same narratives I've been talking about, Shows the silhouette of a child looking at a drag queen and a colorful short haired person angrily yelling. Here's the only thing this petition really says though. Quote, children as young as kindergarten are being exposed to radical ideas about gender in school, media, and entertainment. Mental health and medical professionals insist that gender affirming care is the only acceptable treatment. Parents who object are labeled bigots or even child abusers for not affirming a child's transgender identity. This insanity must stop. Sign the petition to protect minors from harmful transgender ideology. Now, who is this petition to? Who's it for? Doesn't say, but some clues at the bottom might give it away. Like the email address that will be logged into the PragerU database to keep sending out more propaganda, or the opt-in text so you don't miss an update, and the incredibly fellatingly worded, I love PragerU, send me texts about how I can support the work you do. There's also a subscription to Prager Kids, but you should get it by now. From the people they sought out, to the flimsy sources and stories they cite. This isn't actually about protecting kids, but pushing an ideology that trans people of any passing class or affiliation are bad and personally mistaken about who they are. It's easier for people like PragerU to believe that they know what's best for someone and not medical professionals, their friends, family, or even themselves. And their evidence is a bundle of tight-knit detransitioners with obvious ulterior motives. And all of this is for what? You can see it right here, to drive traffic, to get donations, to get subs, to get people to spend and spread more of their poorly sourced emotional appeal propaganda. It is truly following in Matt Walsh's footsteps to do all of this for a grift, but at the end of the day, that doesn't make it any less of a grift. D-trans is a shameful and disingenuous excuse for a documentary that infantilizes and uses its subjects to push a narrative that is easily picked apart by anyone who cares to do so. But unfortunately, I think the majority of people who actually watch it will have their minds already made up. There's nothing new or special or concrete here, just more flimsy fear-mongering about trans people. And if the $1 million spent on buying Twitter ads for this thing is anything to go by, we're only going to keep seeing this kind of thing more and more. Hello everybody and thank you very much for watching. I realize output for the channel lately has been a little bit slow and that's because I have taken on a number of pretty big projects that are pretty research intensive like this one. However, I do have very big things coming. So if you enjoyed this video, please check out the links down below to find out how you can help uh, me keep my lights on and keep improving all of my production. As I always mention, especially on these more intensive videos where I have to show a lot of evidence and research, these videos are the ones that are most likely to be either copyright claimed or outright demonetized, so I definitely appreciate all the help. And additionally, if you'd sign up to be a patron, you get looks at videos like this one as they're being made. That being said, I hope I have a couple more fun videos coming soon because I am definitely working on uh, some more even heavy stuff, which I do apologize for, uh, I like having more happy-go-fun time videos than I have lately, especially focusing on games and stuff, with it being more of a game of the year season and the end of the year coming around, but it has been a tumultuous time in the world and I have felt a certain responsibility to use my platform uh, to talk about these things that are affecting so many people. 
With that being said, as always, I hope you enjoyed the video and let me know down in the comments below if there's anything in particular you'd like me to tackle next. Like I said, I have about four videos I am working on actively at the moment, uh, as well as some more stream highlights that will be coming soon. Be sure if you want to check out the stream where we look at all sorts of fun things, uh, check out Dead Domain on Twitch. That's twitch.tv forward slash dead domain. Other than that, thank you very much for watching and peace out.